Welcome to Core Cutting Today for June 7th, 2019. This is the show where I give you a quick look at some of the biggest stories happening in the world of core cutting right now and my thoughts on them. If you want to read these stories for yourself, come up with your own opinions. I'll put a link to them in the show notes down below and I'd love to hear your thoughts about the biggest stories we're covering today. Well, let's dive into it because it's going to be a busy day. There's tons of news happening in the world of core cutting right now. First up is T-Mobile's 5G service. Now, this is a new service that T-Mobile is working on. It's going to offer both home internet 5G and 5G for your cell phone, rolling out in the next few years to start. It'll take years to get it nationwide. But T-Mobile's, according to their testing, New York um, is averaging between 350 down and 490 down on average for their internet um, service. Now, that's really great internet speed. This was a uh, test conducted by PCMag.com. Uh, I'll put a link to it down below so you can read the full details about it. But this addresses the main concern. The latency was low, the speed was high, more than enough speed to stream uh, TV, to stream your Netflix, who, Amazon, Sling, PlayStation View, DirecTV Now, etc. So this really makes 5G a real legitimate contender for core cars. Now we've already seen it with Verizon's home internet service. We've been very happy. I've already talked to T-Mobile customers who are using their 4G test. So T-Mobile um, accepted a limited number of customers in select markets to start testing a 4G home internet service. It was capped at much lower speed, but they were testing out the hardware, the box, the customer service experience and more. And some of our readers have it. They have reported to be extremely happy with the service. So I'd love to know what you think of this service, uh, or this idea. Would you buy your home internet from T-Mobile? Because there's a lot of options growing right now for home internet, SpaceX, Amazon, 5G, fixed wireless, fiber. And why I talk about this so much is the fact that cutting the cord on home internet is really the next big phase of cord cutting. We cut the cord on TV. Now we're gonna break free from that final Comcast and Spectrum um, cord there with the home internet by having options from places like T-Mobile. While they still may be a big company, it now gives you competition. You're not really stuck with one, maybe two good internet options. Maybe you have four, five, six, or seven options for home internet. And that's why this is so exciting for cord cutters. You know, and it's something that may wipe that smirk off of uh, cable executives who send stages at conferences and say, "Yo, we don't care if you're gonna cut the cord, we'll just make the money off you on home internet. Well, once they have to compete with six or seven home internet providers, they may not be able to do that anymore. So my question to you is, how eager are you to ditch your current internet provider? What would make you switch if you're not all that eager? I'd love to hear from you. All right, next story up of the day. This is a question I get a lot. So we decided to do a post about it. We often do posts, um, core current Q&A posts, where we take a question we get by email or during the Q&As a lot and write about it so that people can have a full broke down article there. Also, we can send the link, we get an email rather than trying to type out a reply every time. But I get a lot of questions about the idea of, do you need a 4K TV to get an Apple TV 4K, a Fire TV Stick 4K, a Roku 4K streaming device and more? I find this is more common with like the Apple TV 4K and the Fire TV Stick 4K because it's got 4K in the name, but I still get it about like the Roku Stick Plus and the Roku Ultra because uh, people are concerned it won't work on their TV because it's just an HD TV. The good news is yes, if you have an HDMI port on your TV, all these devices will work on your um, TV. They will de auto detect what kind of signal your TV can use, HD, SD, 4K, and then set themselves up for that and stream it, um, the content in that particular uh, style there, which is great because not all content streams in 4K. Um, so the content that is in HD on your 4K TV will just go on HD. But if they have a 4K option, they'll stream it in 4K to you. So it's a pretty cool one. But I wanted to do this post. I want to talk about here because it's become a growing question as more and more streaming services with 4K come out. You get the Roku Premiere, Roku Stick Plus, Roku Ultra, uh, Fire TV Stick 4K, Fire TV Cube, and Apple TV Stick 4K to name a few. Or Apple TV 4K. No stick. I wish they had a stick. Apple, get on that. Uh, but... I wanted to make that very clear. So you can get us, and I would highly recommend you actually get a 4K streaming player versus an HD. Because if your TV dies or breaks in the next few years, you and you buy a 4K one, you don't have to go back and buy another Fire TV or Roku or Apple TV. To spend the extra 10, 20 bucks um, 
to get it is well worth it. You know, the, the 4K Roku and Fire TV sticks are only 10 bucks more than the HD. The Apple TV 4K, I believe, is about $20 more. Uh, maybe off, maybe 30, but 20 or 30 bucks off more than the HD Apple TV. If For that money, you're making yourself a lot more future proof. So keep that in mind. I would highly recommend you consider this TV is not going to last forever. For an extra 10 bucks, I'm really set there. And also, the streaming players are much, much more powerful than the HD version, especially with the Fire TV Stick 4K and the Roku Stick Plus. Noticeable power improvement in their performance, which will make them, again, much more future-proof to the more powerful apps coming out right now that take up more um, power and need more processing. All right, let's keep moving along to a story that I've kind of written about in the past, but we have a new study that really breaks this down. The average stream, or average core cutter subscribes to just 3.2 uh, core cutting streaming services. So this is a big picture of the average. They serve um, the research group uh, Zip Media uh, surveyed over 2,000 Americans and, and core cutters and asked them how many streaming services they paid for. This is paid services subscribed to. On average, 3.2. The vast major that means the vast majority are three or less, and um, just a little bit at four or more. So I'm very excited to see this because one of the arguments against core cutting now, you've seen it in stories and newspapers and online websites, and you've even seen cable executives push this idea that you go subscribe to 10 or more services, and then you're suddenly paying more than cable. Um, and, and you know my argument, I always go after these posts and say, hey, let me give a rebuttal to this, and here's my thoughts. Well, here's one more rebuttal I didn't even have to write from Zip Media that clearly lays out the fact that no, most core carters are not subscribing to that many services. That four or fewer, according to our readers, when we surveyed our, them, is what they subscribe to. 90% of core carters subscribe to four or fewer services when we ask our readers. Zip Media says the average is 3.2. And it also brings up another issue, like I've talked about before. Most cable subscribers also pay for a streaming service. So if you had Netflix and Amazon, and you add PlayStation View, YouTube TV, whatever to that, or maybe added Hulu, you really are only adding one new service. So your cable bill drops and you replace it with Hulu, you can't count Netflix and Amazon in that cost of core cutting because you were already paying for that with cable. So keep that in mind when you see these arguments. But this is a growing trend of arguments against core cutting that I find rather hilarious. It's kind of like saying, you know, Eating at home can cost you more money if you buy all the most expensive stuff in the home, right? If I go buy six steaks and two breasts of chicken for one dinner at home, or I go to Applebee's and buy one meal, uh, of course, you know, you can argue that cooking at home costs more. But if you realistically shop, you realistically buy for what you would want at the grocery store, nine times out of 10, cooking at home is cheaper. And it's the same thing with core cutting. For the vast majority of Americans, core cutting will save you money and give you everything you want. Could you find a straw man argument, the idea that there's one person somewhere in the world who wants something that um, needs cable? Yeah, you could. But for the vast majority of Americans, core cutting would give you everything you want for less. And study after study after study has shown that the average savings are 80 to 100 bucks a month, and the average core cutter subscribes now to four or fewer streaming services. So I'd love to know, how many streaming services do you have? Leave us a comment, let me know. And next time you see one of those argument posts or one of those cable executives talking about how it's gonna cost more because you're gonna to subscribe to so many services, don't forget this study. Don't forget our own research. Don't forget, I think it was T, um, DG also did one that said like 3.4, I think was their number earlier this year. So it's all within the statistical um, error range. And it all shows that core cutters don't subscribe to nearly as many services as people think they do. All right, next story of the day. I've been hearing about this. I talked to Google to confirm this, but Google is now playing at two ads back to back at the start of some YouTube videos that are five minutes or, or longer. Now, last year, Google announced that they were testing this as a beta test with the idea that if they show you two ads back to back, you would see fewer ads going forward. Kind of like, hey, watch some ads now, binge watch videos later. Now, um, Google's been tweeting at people that it is 
as if it's basically a standard ad block no longer in beta testing. We try to confirm that with Google. They confirmed they're doing this. They didn't confirm this is a standard ad block now, but it sounds like it from the way they're tweeting about it. But the idea here is that they will offer you two ads back to back if you are okay with, or, and then you won't have to see quite as many ads later. They may skip an ad on a video going down the road. Now, I would love to know what your thoughts are on this. Are you happy to watch two ads at the beginning of a YouTube video if it means you'll see later fewer ads later? Or would you rather see an ad at the beginning and an ad at the end, for example? I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but it is kind of one of those things. You know, YouTube has been suffering a little bit from the ad apocalypse again. There's been a lot of negative attention to YouTube TV about maybe some inappropriate content, both on videos and in the comments. Comments have become a more uh, popular issue. YouTube has moved to black comments and videos with kids in it and more. Uh, and now it seems like to kind of deal with the fact that they're not maybe getting as many ad dollars that they are moving to maybe show two ads at the beginning to try to counter that. It's kind of one of those issues, you know, the ads do support Google, but more importantly, they support creators like myself. And to have more ad revenue, I can't, you know, as for many creators is needed. That's why we see many creators going to sponsored videos. So keep an eye on that. Um, link in, um, again, link in the show notes down below if you want to read Google's full statement on this. But I'd love to know, what's your balance? Is this too much? You know, are you going around and get Google's um, YouTube um, premium feature where you get ad free? Or would this reduce your viewing of YouTube videos? Leave me a comment, let me know. It is again, longer form videos, which I really like. I do remember when I was in Korea, seeing some very long, unskippable ads in Korea um, there on YouTube that you could not get past these ads. Some of them were a couple minutes long before you could watch a video. So let me know what you think of this move. Fortunately, we're not as bad as that. And I think YouTube is trying to go away from that. The good news is they did say if they do show two videos back to back, they will be skippable videos. So you'll be six seconds in, skip, six seconds and skip if you want. So let me know what you think of that. Uh, next story, so robocalls. And robocalls have actually been a big issue in core cutting because there's a growing number of them that of course, we all know the IRS. We all know the Social Security number has been discontinued. You all know, probably had those, there's an arrest warrant out for you kind of calls from robocalls. Well, there's also been a growing trend of Netflix robocalls. Like, oh, your Netflix account has been suspended due to non-payment. Please, you know, you know, whatever, give us your credit card so we can update your Netflix account. Now the FCC has approved letting companies like Verizon, at and and T-Mobile block robocalls from even ringing on your phone. I think this is a great feature. Um, this runs alongside to several new features, uh, Stir and Shaken, which are acronyms for two new types of technology which are meant to identify spoof caller IDs. When people try to fake their caller ID to look like the IRS or look like different companies, this will come up and try to prevent that. T-Mobile started rolling out. Verizon, I believe it has. at t is supposedly rolling it out. T-Mobile, I think, was one of the first to roll it out. But um, the FCC has basically said, no, you can block these. You do not have to worry about FCC cracking down on you and allow this. I love this idea. I hate robocalls as much as the next person. Unfortunately, with my job, I can't just um, only pick up phone numbers I identify. I often get phone calls from PR firms and other companies that... I don't know, but that I need to actually talk to. I'm sure if you're a plumber or a tradesman or a salesperson, you're probably in a similar position where you can't always just not answer a call you do not recognize. So I'm very excited that they're now able to go and block these calls and go from there. Now, this is one step. It shouldn't be the end of this because there still will be some. But it'll be interesting to know, have you seen a drop in robocalls? I think I have seen a drop in robocalls recently, uh, but it's still far from perfect. So I'd love to hear from you uh, what you think about this move. I I'd love to hear if you've received any of the Netflix or Roku or Amazon robocalls that tell you your credit card needs to be updated. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and what your experience is. Link in the show notes if you want to learn more, if you want to read the FCC statement on it, and go from there. All right, last story of the day. at t is launching a Netflix-like streaming service, an on-demand streaming service to take, to take Time Warner, now Warner Media content, and bundle it together in a streaming service along with Cinemax and HBO content. 
and stream it out. Well, according to the Wall Street Journal, at and is planning to charge between $16 and $17 a month, maybe $16.99, let's say, um, for this service. Now, you will get both HBO Now and Cinemax, plus all this other content. So it's like $2 at that price for all this other Time Warner content on top of what you would have been paying for HBO, which may make it a decent deal. The tough part about this is the fact that if you don't care about HBO and you want to get all the Time Warner content, there's a seemingly no way to do that. Initially, it had been reported that Time Warner and AT&T were going, excuse me, Warner Media now. Time Warner is so ingrained in my mind, it's going to take a while for that. Warner Media had been planning to do a three-tiered system. So you get like a discounted plan with no HBO content all the ways up. Well, now the corner reports are ditching the three-tier system and they're going to go to one single tier that will include the Cinemax, the HBO Now content, and some of this um, Warner Media content uh, all included. So I'd love to know your thoughts about this, what you think of everything happening with this move. Would you pay that price? Do you, Is this a great deal? If you have HBO, two more bucks and you get a ton of other content. If you don't have HBO, but you were kind of thinking, you were hoping they would bring some of your older shows you may remember from the 2000s or the um, 1990s or whenever it may be that were Warner Media uh, properties, uh, you know, are you upset about the idea that this is going to be $16, $17? I think the problem that um, at and is going to have here is Disney's at $6.99. It's very difficult for Disney or for um, people to compete with Disney. They have such a huge catalog of content coming in there and they're so beloved. I can get a ton of Disney content for $6.99. I can get some Time Warner content for $17. Which way are you gonna go on that? I think that's one thing at and needs to be careful about is their content may not be at, as desirable as they may think it is. So I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this. Leave me a comment, let me know. And I'll put a full story down below so you can read everything that was kind of announced and leaked about the new service and you can come up with your own opinions. Well, that's it for today. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I have big plans next week, so but I will still be here um, tomorrow for our weekly recap and on Monday for our daily core cutting today show. So check out the show notes for all the stories. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our videos, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it.